Hare Krishna. Thank you for having me on this most auspicious occasion of Janmashtami. It's a milestone, so quite naturally, we all would remember. And it is said that for one to learn Shastra, one has to be able to share. So when you give me an opportunity to share, it becomes a purifying experience for me because I get to remember. And since it's a joyous occasion of Janmashtami, it's going to be even more profound that I would remember the occasion. I would remember everyone here and I would cherish your association. So thank you so much. Um, I was not given a specific topic. I was merely said, talk. And I said, I will. <laughs> I obeyed the Vaishnavas. Okay. I was not given a specific topic. So what I am going to do is I'm going to choose this and we're going to go through a few aspects of Krishna consciousness. We would be touching upon um, the occasion. We would also be touching upon the process. And uh, we would be trying to set ourselves up for future success as each year, as each day and each minute progresses uh, in our lives. So um, I think I should start by first um, talking about two objectives that are given in the Shastras. Our Shastras speak of two objectives, two primary objectives. The first objective which is spoken of as being attained as a fruit of engaging in sadhana bhakti is kleshagni, complete freedom from material affliction. Yeah. Complete freedom from material affliction, which is all the kleshas are burnt up, and this is the first fruit of engaging in devotional service. So it's very often we observe that some devotees give the appearance of being a bit naive in worldly affairs. It's almost as if they don't react to the world as they're supposed to. They don't react in the same level of urgency as someone else would. It may also appear that they're naive, that perhaps they lack common sense, they're not as reactive. In reality, they are not. It is simply an effect of their powerful sadhana, which practically introduces the concept of Kleshagni into their hearts, where the affliction of the material world is not experienced to the extent to which a normal person would because of the benediction given by the Harinam. You see, Harinam has three stages. The three stages of Harinam that we know of perceptively is Namaparat. And during Namaparat, the devotee ends up experiencing material benedictions in certain ways. They accumulate certain benedictions. You would find that material desires exist and under the last offense which is being committed, you know, which is being spoken of every day when we read the 10 offenses is the offense of developing and maintaining material desires even after receiving so many instructions on the same topic. So this is Namaprad, material desires that exist even though we have been spoken about, we have been cautioned several times over. That is Namaprad and that is the fruit of Namaprad. The fruit of Namaprad is one has material desires. One has a propensity to enjoy in the world. One has a propensity to exist in the world. They have plans that are very much situated on the terrestrial platform. They are not extraterrestrial, the ET, yet. You know, they're very much terrestrial. They're very, very terrestrial. In other words, there are plans. And why is it we wonder that the holy name doesn't taste the same as it is supposed to? What is being described in Shastra and why don't we even develop the taste? The reason is very obvious. There is Namaprad. And Namaprad can be examined very closely in our hearts if we have desires that are very much a part of this world. It's actually quite dangerous. When we examine it, it's a simple barometer. And we need to be able to examine our desires every once in a while to take inventory. We should be able to look at it and say that this is where we are. This is one such day. This is one such day where we have to very, very carefully take inventory of ourselves. It's a milestone. It's a very big milestone. Each year as we come to Gaur Purnima, a Gauravda begins. And it's a great day for us to have, have resolve. It's a great day for us to develop a certain vision. It is a great day for us to ask for benediction because the Lord who is Mahavadanyaya on that particular day is even more munificent. On a similar fish, uh, uh, vein, Janmashtami is extraordinarily auspicious. Interestingly, the day Ashtami, Krishna or Suklapaksha Ashtami is considered extraordinarily inauspicious from a material perspective. Ashtami is inauspicious from a material perspective. You do nothing. 
material. Absolutely nothing is done. You can't do marriages. Nothing of anything of auspiciousness is done on Ashtami. If someone is born on an Ashtami, they require remedial measures so that they have a smooth life. <laughs> you see? It's interesting. But then the Srimad Bhagavatam gives us a completely different description of Krishna's birth. When it talks of Janmashtami, it does not really say that the planets are badly situated. It does not talk of inauspicious circumstances. It says that the planets are wonderfully situated. The sun is you know, beautifully situated. The moon is exalted. It is pouring out its divine rays. All the planets are very happy. The entire world was very happy. The granaries are full. Everything is wonderful. Then I was wondering, how could the Bhagavatam be so contradictory to material experience because some other Shruti and some other Shastra talks about Ashtami being inauspicious. You see? Then the realization dawned upon me by the mercy of Srila Prabhupada and my spiritual master that Krishna, when he descended, he descended with the spiritual world. So when he descended with the Dham, it is always auspicious. It's an extraordinarily auspicious event. So what was observed was actually the spiritual phenomenon of Krishna descending with the entire spiritual sky with his divine paraphernalia and with everyone in touch. And as a consequence, what was observed was a slice of the spiritual sky. Just as much as when we visit Vrindavan, when we visit Mayapur, we get this realization that even though we observe certain material aspects which may not be quite as good, we are so attracted to the transcendental aspects of the Dham because the spiritual sky is a part of eternally present in Vrindavan, Mayapur. We come in touch with the spiritual sky if we have some focus. So it's quite auspicious. So in that sense, the point we want to make here is that I was wanting to reflect on what should I speak on. And I was thinking that I will speak on goal setting. I will speak on milestones because this is a day for people to be setting goals. They have to say that this is a marker. Today is Janmashtami and what do I accomplish between this Janmashtami and the other which is coming up? Or two Janmashtamis hence, where would I stand in devotional service? Where am I today and where, where, should I, or, you know, where should I be? So it's very important for us to develop a certain sense of being able to manage a spiritual life very closely with complete realization of where the pitfalls are and where is the, what is it which is required and what is it which is not required. What should the internal mindset be? It is not so much the externals, it is more an internal reflection as to how we are going to proceed further. So I was reflecting on it, I was thinking I'll speak on milestones today. I'll talk about setting milestones. And before we speak on milestones, we need to understand the goal. We can't really talk about milestones without having a goal. If you're a project manager and you want to attain and you want to set up milestones, why would you set up milestones without understanding where you ought to be going? You see, there's a saying in Africa which says, for a man who doesn't know where to go, any road is fine. <laughs> yeah, but that's not the case with us. You know, any road is not fine with us. We have a specific road. We have been given rules, regulations. We have been set on a path. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about milestones. Before we do that, let's take blessings from the Acharyas and then we'll proceed. Namam Vishnu Padai Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Tirtha Swaminiti Namine Namaste Krishna Padaya Prabhupada Shritatmane Gaura Karuna Shakti Bhakti Tirtha Tinamine Namam Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Saraswat Devam Gauravani Pacharine Nirvisesha Shunya Vadim Paschate De Satarine O Magyana Timurandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Malitame Natasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bishtam Stapitame Nabutale Swayam Rupa Kadamahyam Dadati Sopadantikam Bandeham Shri Guru Shri Utapada Kamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavam Shri Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sagana Raghunatan Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Radha Krishna Padan Sagana Lalita Shri Vishakan Vitam Shep He Krishna Karuna Sindho Dina Bando Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindhavaneshwari Vishabhanu Sate Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vanchakalpata Rubhya Shikrapa Sindhubhya Evacha Patitanam Pavane Bio Vaishnave Bio Namo Namaha Sri Krishna Chaitanya Pavo Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadada Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda 
हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे नमो नमो अनिरुद्धाय ऋषिकेश इंद्रिय आत्मने नम परमहंसाय पूर्णाय निवृत्तात्मने स्वर्ग अपवर्ग द्वाराय नित्यम सुचि सदे नम नम हिण्य वीरियाय चातुर्होत्राय तांतवे सो The first thing that we want to do before we want to understand where the goal is to be established is to approach the shastra with in taking into consideration what Krishna wanted us to do. So what does he say in 4.9? 4.9 is an important verse because he says in 4.9 janma karma chame divyam okay evam yobetti tatvatah One who knows the transcendental nature of my appearance and activities does not, upon leaving the body, take his birth again in this material world, but attains my eternal abode, O Arjuna. Krishna is saying, one has to approach me, you will have to approach me through tattva. There is a very important word here, tattvataha. You should underline the word in this particular verse, which is tattvataha, where he says, Krishna says, if you want to understand me, you have to understand me through tattva, which is absolute consideration. you cannot understand me through your senses you cannot understand me through hearsay you have to approach tattva and then further down in 4.34 he talks about tadviddhi pranipatena pariprashnena sevaya upadekshanti te gyanam gyanina tattva darshina so the tattva darshi has to be approached with humility and with submissive inquiry and one has to render seva so he says just try to learn the truth by approaching a spiritual master tattva darshini tattva darshina is a spiritual master someone who has seen tattva someone who has experienced reality by their spiritual perception they are not speculating what does tattva darshan mean we read in the brahma samhita saying the lord is lying on the causal ocean and each breath he takes you know scores and scores of lord brahmas perish because the universe has entered into his pores of his skin when he exhales the universe is a manifest again you know this is a statement now tattva darshi is not speculating when he is hearing the statement he is not speculating when he is reading that statement a tattva darshi when he is writing the statement when he is reading it is practically having a visual of the causal ocean where the lord is lying down and this phenomenon is being manifested shila jeeva goswami says this in the sandarbhas this is tattva darshan tattva darshan means you see through your spiritual senses what is pratyaksha spiritual senses for those who realize fully and when they write and when they speak that is shabda praman that shabda praman shabda brahman is what we take account for why do we believe the bhagavad gita why do we believe the shrimad bhagavatam why do we believe shri prabhupad it is because he has seen the truth he is writing with conviction and because he is writing with conviction the consequences that a worldwide movement was established the literature was published and it became the most widely published literature and most widely read in terms of the voluminized work in that category why is it so it is because it has purity when there is purity and when there is tattva darshan it has to be understood that way we do not want to simply say that shila vyasadev was understanding things and which we can't understand he understood it no he was seeing it please have this in your heart he was seeing it and i'm saying this because why should shastra use the word tattva darshan this is tattva darshan there is internal realization the spiritual vision they are able to see it the premi bhakta is able to see the spiritual sky the premi bhakta is able to see krishna why is there in this body if one can see krishna why wouldn't they see the expansion of his expansion who is karunadas jai vishnu who is lying on the causal ocean why wouldn't they able to see him please understand that shastra has to be taken literally under the guidance of a tattva darshi it has to be taken literally when we have a simple mindset of approaching shastra and guru their words would make a lot of sense when we apply our intelligence and we make inferences based on what is logical based on our own sense of measurement we would meet with failure shastra has to be observed and it has to be approached with scrutiny 
but the scrutiny has to be done with an extraordinarily humble heart. I am scrutinizing to know, and I have to approach the spiritual master. So the first line that Krishna is saying here is that if you want to really approach me, then you better become submissive because it's not going to work otherwise. And what is submissive? You don't want to just surrender to anyone. We want to surrender to a Tattva Darshi. Anyone who is surrendered to Srila Prabhupada and who has taken up the baton, passed on by Srila Prabhupada in the disciplic succession and is very sincere, is a Tattva Darshi. We don't want to speculate on which one of the disciples of Srila Prabhupada today is a Tattva Darshi. Everyone is if they are sincerely following Srila Prabhupada. Everyone is if they are sincerely following Srila Prabhupada. So we want to accept it through the disciplic succession because there's a connection. The connection will pass the hierarchy down to us. So having established that we have to learn Krishna and about Krishna from Tattva, having established that the Tattva Darshi is a personality who has seen the truth, which is what Shastra says, who has really seen everything and is recording his vision, just as much as we observe a motor car passing and we can say it's blue, it's white, and this is the make. He has seen it and he has recorded it. And that's where the words make a lot of sense. Do not approach Shastra by speculating, saying that they are trying to postulate. They are not trying to postulate. They are not giving us, um, you know, metaphors. There are metaphors in the Srimad Bhagavatam, but they are not doing it here in for most part when they are describing the glories of the Supreme Lord. We have to be very careful because that particular moment of doubt will lead us down. So it's a very slippery slope. We have to be careful. That's the reason why it's better to absorb and better to accept. Now, that's a safer path. It's auspicious. Now, where is the goal being sp spoken of? The goal is being spoken of in the 18th chapter. It's being spoken of several times over in the Bhagavad Gita, but more so in the 18th chapter, because the 18th chapter is a summary of mostly what has already been spoken, but he concludes it with certain very powerful statement. What does he say in 18.64? Sarva gohyatmam puyaha shunume paramam vachaha ishto shime dridam iti tato vakshayami te hitam because you are my very dear friend, I'm speaking to you, my supreme instruction, the most confidential knowledge of all. Hear this from me, for it is for your benefit. Most confidential knowledge. When the supreme person is using the word most confidential, when he's using the word, this is extraordinarily confidential, isn't this something which is worth paying a lot of attention to? Is it, shouldn't there be an extraordinary amount of instruction in the next two verses, if he's really making that statement? So what does he say in 6.5? Always think of me, become my devotee, worship me and offer your homage unto me. Thus you will come to me without fail. I promise you this because you are my very dear friend. There are many clues here in this verse. There are many, many clues. And the first one is we want to start thinking. He says, always think of me. Can always think of me be a goal, Prabhu? I want Mataji's, I want participation. Because some of you are very tired, I'm sure. So I just want to kind of have a little bit of interaction here. So we don't lose each other in the process. Hmm? So, can you always think of Krishna? Can that be a goal? We're talking about goal setting. This is a milestone day. Can that be a goal? Yes, it can. Can, can it be? Yes. Okay. She says it can, can be. Who else? Can it be? It can be a goal. There are many hands which have been showing up that always think of him can be a goal. Yes. But how do you plan for always think of him? That's an awesome, awesome, awesome situation where always think of him is difficult to plan. But when does always think of him happen? Always think of him happens by observing even material phenomena we can understand. When young people they are completely besought, they're in love with each other, teenagers. They can't think of anything else. Yes. They can't think of anything else because they are so smitten. They can't eat, they can't sleep, they can't do anything. It's natural phenomena. So what does it say? It simply says that that phenomenon which we observe in the material world, which is a perversion of attraction, there's something attractive about that girl, there's something attractive about that boy, and that perversion is simply that we are attracted to a certain concept of beauty which Krishna has. It is manifesting itself in material nature. People are getting attracted to it. But this attraction is worthy. Please make a note of it. It's worthy. Why is it worthy of attention? Why is it something we ought to pay attention to? It is because it is telling us that we are capable of losing ourselves, thinking of someone else. It is telling us that we have capacity. 
It's telling us that we can be completely absorbed and lose ourselves. We may not sleep, we may not eat, we may not do anything. Where do we observe this behavior? Where else do we observe this behavior? This behavior, yeah, I'm sorry. Gopis in Vrindavan. Gopis in Vrindavan. How about much closer to them? When a mother loves a child so much. A mother loves a child, yes. When a, when a, when a, between a husband and wife, and there is that intense love. Yes, I observe, yeah, I acknowledge that. Where do, where do we observe it in devotional service? That's the mundane side. But where do we observe it in devotional service? Where is it being recorded as being observed in devotional service? The Chaitanya Chaitamrita is full of accounts of people fainting when they see a peacock feather. It's full of accounts of people not being able to eat, not being able to sleep, crying all the time and rolling around in the ground. It is full of accounts. That is the reason why it's postgraduate study because if you don't understand Tattva from the Bhagavatam, if you don't understand what is Tattva from the Bhagavad Gita, understand the Bhagavatam, develop the purity to understand that, oh, reading Srimad Bhagavatam can and living Srimad Bhagavatam can make someone mad, madly in love. You see, we wouldn't understand it. That's why it's postgraduate study. You don't approach the Chaitanya Charitamrita. It's difficult to understand. Why is it difficult to understand? Because it is the action of Premi Bhaktas. It is the action of those who are in love. And you can't really <clears throat> comprehend that because we don't have that experience. We can't really comprehend that. It may seem far reaching. Some of us even may doubt it. We may even think it's an exaggeration. We may even think that we have to interpret it in certain ways. It's postgraduate study because if the Bhagavatam has not been read and if the Bhagavatam, more importantly, has not been lived, there's a big difference between reading and living. Okay, Living Shastra is a completely different level. Living Shastra is where the Shastra has been witnessed, Shastra has been digested and has been experienced by the devotee and he starts living the precepts. So it's very important. There are many examples. So living the Shastra of Srimad Bhagavatam is being exhibited in the Chaitanya Charitamrita and you have people acting like mad men and in some cases women as well. <coughs> Completely lost. <laughs> Completely lost. And it has similar appearances to the so-called behavior of mundane uh, lovers. It does have the same, you know, the same, more or less the symptoms, but that is transcendental, Divya Mada, and this is real madness. <coughs> There's a big difference between the two types of madness. Hmm? <coughs> Excuse me. So, the point of falling in love is the topic which I want to talk about. So, the idea is the awesome goal that's been given to us, if you want to interpret, 18.65. When he says, always think of me. The, the awesome goal that's been given to us is he says, you fall in love with me. That's what he's telling us. He's saying, you have to fall in love, Arjun. Devotees, you have to fall in love. And he's saying, I'm sharing this because you're my very dear friend. I'm sharing this because you're my very dear friend. You see? He's saying, you're very dear to me. You have a relationship, so I'm sharing this. And then the question becomes, next, what does he say? How do you fall in love is being given. He says, Sarva dharman paritejya, mami kam sharanam raja, aham tom sarva pape bio moksha yasmi masuchaha. Abandon all varieties of religion. Practically, abandon all varieties of religion, priorities, duties that are disconnected from me. Just as much as someone who is in love would not be able to think of anything else. They can't think of their duties. They become dysfunctional in society. So he's practically saying, he's not telling Arjun to be dysfunctional. He's saying, you have to reach the platform. But how do you fall in love? How do you fall in love without knowing who we are and without knowing who the object of love is. And it's a very important principle. That's why, what did I say? Nama Parad grants us and binds us to the material world in certain ways because Nama Parad means we commit offenses. Vaishnava Parad, Guru Parad, Shastra Parad, all of these Aparad eventually devel we develop material desires. Once Nama Parad is over, and one can examine it in their hearts. One can really know that Nama Prad is over from their hearts. The next stage begins, which is Nama Bas. Nama Bas is practically the situation of being offenseless while chanting. We have still not reached the goal. It is offenseless chanting. Practically where the devotee has cleansed their heart. And now they're saying, Krishna, just give me a place at your lotus feet. 
Allow me to serve you. I have no other desire. Lord Chaitanya says this, isn't it? In the Sikshashtakam. He says that I don't have a desire for wealth. I don't have a desire for beautiful women, fame. Fame comes last. Fame actually is the quality of the mode of goodness. So it comes very much in the last. It takes long time for fame to be given up, the desire for fame. Devotees, even they want a pat in the back every once in a while. They want to be recognized because they're mostly situated in the mode of goodness. So this is a disease of the mode of goodness that you can even come in touch with fame and say, I want fame. So it takes a while for that to go away, to be completely free even of the effect of the mode of goodness in the material world. So Lord Chaitanya says that. He says that I do not want any of this. And he's practically saying, I don't want any of this. So he reaches a point. So this lack of desires of wanting anything but wanting to chant the holy names. This is Namabas. This is the stage when one would be liberated. Mere offenseless chanting of the holy names grants one liberation. Please mark this. This is not a statement which is being made out of the air. It's recorded in Shastra. Mere chanting of the holy names without offenses can grant one liberation. This is Kleshagni. One is granted liberation. Then comes the point of relationship. First, you have to be free from bodily concept. And then comes the point of understanding who we are. And then comes the point of understanding who is Krishna. Please understand that there are varying degrees of understanding who is Krishna. Very important for us to understand. The mellow of relationship that we have with Krishna is not the same. It differs. One can be liberated, but how much of Krishna can they know? How closely can they approach Krishna? What is their proximity? What is the relationship? It differs. And I want to read from the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. I want to read from the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam to show how the difference is very clearly manifest. Sorry, I'm just getting there. Verse 20. Yeah, this is Mother Devaki. Let's look at the relationship of Mother Devaki with Krishna. You're going to notice the difference. That first there is liberation. You're gone to the spiritual sky. Yes. Beyond the spiritual sky, there's a relationship. The mellow. Now let's look at the different mellows. Okay, this is Mother Devaki. This is verse 10th canto, 3rd chapter, 30. I'm just reading the translation. O Madhusudana, because of your appearance, I am becoming more and more anxious in the fear of Kamsa. Therefore, please arrange for that sinful Kamsa to be unable to understand that you have taken birth from my womb. There's a prayer offered by Mother Devaki. Okay, next verse. Oh my Lord, you are the all-pervading supreme personality of Godhead and your transcendental forearm form holding conch shell, disc, club and lotus is unnatural for this world. Please withdraw this form and become just like a normal natural human child that so, I may, that, so that I may try to hide you somewhere. Hmm? What are these two verses telling us? Number one, that she is quite bewildered. She doesn't know how to handle that relationship. Mm-hmm. Krishna has exposed himself with his conch shell, with his maze, with his chakra. She doesn't know how to handle that relationship. She is practically telling Krishna, Oh Madhusudana, it's a son. It's a son. But does she really have the connection with him as a son? It's a mixture. There's an extraordinary influence of Krishna's opulence, which is being overpowering the relationship here. Does it make sense, devotees? Yeah, there's a big difference. Okay, she is not seeing Krishna as a son. She is seeing Krishna as the Supreme Lord. And she is saying, come, some might recognize you. Someone might recognize you. The world would ridicule me. Become a baby so that I can hide you somewhere. So she is quite mixed in the mellow of looking at him as a son. And then suddenly she says, this is not my son. This is four armed. He has got all these weapons. He is the Supreme Lord. She's, so she's shifting from one side to the other. In one, she says, I'm your mother and I want to hide you. In another, she says, protect us. Can you see that? There's so much confusion in the two verses. This is Mother Devaki, the mother of the Supreme Lord. This is Mother Devaki. Okay, I'm making a point here. So please pay attention 
These two verses are saying that Mother Devaki was quite bewildered. Now let's look at what happens towards the end of this chapter. It's quite significant. This is Mother Eshoda. Okay, let's look at it. The translation, which is the last verse of third chapter, 10th canto. Exhausted by the labor of childbirth, Eshoda was overwhelmed with sleep and unable to understand what kind of child had been born to her. <laughs> she had no knowledge of the baby next to her. She had no knowledge. So what do you think Mother Eshoda started off with? Did she start off with saying this is the Supreme Lord? Was she bewildered? Was she confused? Yes or no? Yes. She wasn't. Do you see the difference between Raja Bhakti and Mathura Bhakti? Yes. Do you see the difference between Dwaraka and Raja? Do you see the difference? It is such a big difference. Now we have to wonder if Mother Devaki was not qualified to have an experience of Krishna as a son, then what is our qualification? Where are we when we aspire to run in the pastures of Raja? Where are we when we want to treat him like a son? Where are we when we want to serve him in Vrindavan? Are we qualified to be anything in Vrindavan? When Mother Devaki wasn't qualified, how is our qualification stacking up? We have no qualifications. Huh? We have no qualifications whatsoever. So what is the point which I'm trying to make here? Is it to make us all feel despondent? No. The point I'm trying to make here is that what's being given to us is awesome. What has been given to us is awesome. It is, what has been given to us is so special that the residents of Mathura, the residents of you know, the Dwaraka, the residents of the different Vaikuntha planets did not have access to it. What has been given and distributed in the streets of the world by Srila Prabhupada, by the mercy of Lord Nityananda, by the orders of Lord Chaitanya, is Krishna Prema, which is the goal. The goal of life which is being given to us is not accessible to the residents of Vaikuntha. It has been distributed on this planet in different parts of the world. Here in Manchester, in New Jersey, wherever we are from. Isn't this awesome just to think about it? We should be very enthusiastic with it. I'm sorry? We should be very enthusiastic. We should be super enthusiastic. We should be ready to do anything. Yeah. We should be ready to do anything. Do you know the price which Mother Devaki paid? Yeah. <laughs> Want to read that? It's just there, a few more verses. The price she paid to have him as a baby. When she was Devaki, she had to really, literally, as a mother, witness the murder of several children. Literally. Before that, she had to undergo millions and thousands of years of austerity. Hmm? Sadhana. Not ordinary sadhana. <laughs> ordinary sadhana. This is different. And then here, Lord Chaitanya is coming in. And he is distributing this Krishna Prema, the love of Godhead, in the streets of the world so easily. And Srila Prabhupada has not put any strictures. He has not given us a very lofty you know, uh, sadhana which for us to be able to focus. Now please reflect on this. This is Janmashtami. How many of us are willing to pay any price to attain what has been given by Lord Chaitanya, Prema? This is the goal. Lift up your hands. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. <laughs> See, there's a certain vulnerability, which is fine. Hmm? So I want you to f reflect on Janmashtami, that this is an awesome goal. Well, the truth is, we're not willing to pay any huh? The truth is, we're not willing to pay any That's the truth. No, well, the eagerness has to be there to submit ourselves, saying, I want this. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I don't even think that is... No, it's, it, no, no, the point is, it's fine. If you have not shown your hands, it's perfectly fine. Okay, we don't have to... You don't have to tell me. Don't worry. But, um, well, well, yeah. What I'm looking for is that... that it, this is being given to the most sinful persons, including you, the most fallen can, can get access. But those most fallen... <laughs> They have no appreciation of the jewel. It's true, I guess. It's a good point. And no experience. It's a good point. The point, yeah, the point I was trying to make, uh, the point I was trying to make is that when you have a goal which is so rare, a gift has been given which is so rare, which is completely unattainable, then the, 
the focus of life should be that goal. It should be that. It should simply be that Srila Prabhupada has given me this task. I'm ready to do anything for Srila Prabhupada. This was the mood of our predecessors, devotees. This was the mood of our predecessors. My spiritual master, His Holiness Bhakti Tita Maharaj, he made a statement once in New Vrindavan. He said, I would probably not do what I did for Srila Prabhupada if someone were to pay me a million bucks a month in salary. I wouldn't. Because he and several other devotees and all these Prabhupada disciples those days, they abandoned everything. They focused on the mission, spread it. Many risked their lives. Many paid even the ultimate price in trying to serve Srila Prabhupada. This was done out of a sense of duty and sense of affection for the spiritual master. My spiritual master used to make a statement saying, there's also Shastra conclusion, one should be able to take wounds on behalf of the spiritual master. Why so? Why is this statement coming from the devotees? Why should one be so eager to do anything for them to be able to attain this prema? Because it is su dur laba. This is a Shastric version. Prema is good fortune. We use the word when good fortune arises. This is real good fortune, which is not even available to the Vaikuntavasis. It is not available even to the Mathuravasis. It's only available to Vrajvasis, and we have been given a line to reach there. Yeah. Isn't this awesome? Isn't this something which is just amazingly celebratory for us to think of? I was just watching some of the news accounts of Olympic medal winners. In India, there weren't many, there were two. So it was worth reading about them. And the reason is, you know, success to them, because it's a difficult country to be in if you have these goals. It's easy to go and sit in a hut and chant, but it's difficult to be an Olympic winner from India because they don't really put a lot of resources. It's quite difficult, you know. People don't take this up. So if you're achieving it, it's quite a big deal. What is observable was I read about the sacrifices made by these people. The sacrifices made by these Olympic winners was some of them had foregone their favorite foods for many, many months. Some of them have foregone the cell phone, which is an addiction for most people. No messaging, no nothing. They were in isolation so that they could just focus on improving the timing, focus on being able to improve from one mile to the other. Because milliseconds count when you're at the you know, world level at the Olympic. You see? People were celebrating runners who made it in 9.87 seconds because they're breaking a record of 100 meters in 9.87, 9.7. They're talking about 10 seconds. 10 seconds. You see? Milliseconds. Milliseconds, perhaps. People are just kind of so focused on the number of seconds, minutes, so on. It's fascinating. It is really fascinating to see how close they were and coming to it and how much they had to pay in terms of a price. When you, when you analyze the gymnasts, they take in extraordinary physical pain to reach the goals. Exactly. But we don't have that. <laughs> no, the point is, yeah, the point which I'm trying to make is, yeah, I agree. The point I'm trying to make is that from very mundane achievements, people are ready to pay the price. They know what it is. So what is it which is deficient? They know that they have to attain a certain benchmark and they know what it takes to do it. And then they examine themselves and say, do I have it in me to make it? And then they put in 100% of what ought to be done. So this is what it is. I can relate to it in one sense. I've heard from my spiritual master. He was a Princeton graduate. He was very well employed. He had a house. He had a fiance. He was going to get married. He had a car and everything, everything a young man would probably hope for at the age of 22, 23. You know, the whole world was in front of him. He was going to go to the UN next. Then he heard this Srila Prabhupada's tape. And when he heard Srila Prabhupada's tape, he just heard Srila Prabhupada's words. And he came out of the room and hugged his fiance saying, the marriage is over. We're not going to get married. <laughs> you know, there's something went on. I heard this tape. I heard this tape. And this tape has just gripped me. I can't function. The person who is speaking in this tape and the chanting has just taken over my life. I can't function. His fiance was a spiritualist as well, so she couldn't understand. So they parted. They parted at that point in time. He sold his house, sold his car, sold everything and joined the temple full time. Quit his job. And the reason which he said, it was much later, was because he found that this was a worthy goal. 
this was something worthy enough to dedicate his life and to give up everything and then just dedicate himself. It was a worthy goal. So obviously, Guru Maharaj, you know, has been a practitioner of Krishna consciousness for many, many lifetimes. So it's not like he's new to it. He came into this lifetime, he took it up, and he immediately was able to take a decision that this is a worthy goal, I have to do it, and I can't be distracted with all of this because I've found what I need to do. So we see so many precepts in our own society of devotees who have taken up a goal, have made it their life, and they're ready to make the sacrifice, and they're just focused on it. 100%. No distraction whatsoever. Krishna is expecting this. That's what he's saying when he says Sarvadharman Parityajya. He's practically saying, prioritize my relationship with you as number one. Everything else goes to the periphery. It doesn't mean we stop being fathers, mothers, professionals. It means all of that has to take a secondary stance in relationship to the relationship that we're trying to foster with Krishna. All of that has to take a secondary stance. So the instruction which is being given is a primary instruction. It is obvious. It's black and white. There really isn't any need for interpretation. There really isn't. So the question then becomes as to what is it which we ought to do. Let's go into Srimad Bhagavatam. Today I want to just share a daily practice of mine. Because today is a day when you want to set up a milestone. I want to share a daily practice of mine. And which was very inspiring. So I want to go into the Bhagavatam for this. In the fourth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, we read about the Prachetas. King Prachinabari is a very old king. He feels very tired. His bones are aching. And he says, I have 10 sons, the Prachetas. I must ask them to take over the kingdom from me because they would be able to take over the kingdom because I'm growing old. So he talks to them. He says, come, I want to talk to you. I want you to take over the kingdom from me and I want you to rule. The Prachetas, the moment they hear, Oh, you want us to rule? And he says, I want you to get married and then rule. Now, they become completely frustrated. They say, you want me to get married and you want me to rule. This is such a big task. I can't take it up. Can you imagine the attitude? And the reason they can't take it up is because they know that their spiritual progress can get thwarted if they were to proceed in that particular instruction. So they tell their father that, okay, I can do it. We can't disobey you. But first, let me attain the spiritual goal. So to prepare for the function of getting married and to take up the rulership of the world, the Prachetas go into penance for thousands of years. They go into penance for thousands of years. As they were moving towards the penance for thousands of years, and they reached this wonderful lake. And this lake was so tranquil. There were swans, the beautiful fruit-laden trees around, and there were such wonderful things around the lake. It was extraordinarily peaceful, extraordinarily sweet. So they sit there, and just as they're approaching it, they hear kettle drums, they hear drums, they hear bugles, they hear very big celebratory uh, words coming forth. And then they look to see is the Lord Shiva. Lord Shiva is coming accompanied by many personalities. And he is described as being golden. Lord Shiva has different forms. The Tamasa Rupa of destruction is bluish black. The golden form is that of a spiritual master. Lord Shiva comes as a spiritual master. Because now you have people wanting to dedicate themselves to spiritual pursuit. So he's wanting to come and give instructions on making their pursuit clear and free of obstacles. So he approaches and he starts giving instructions. When he starts giving instructions in the Bhagavatam, we hear that fourth chapter, fourth canto, uh, you know, 28th chapter is the song sung by Lord Shiva. These are instruction songs for those who have a goal in mind and who want to attain the goal. And the Prachetas had a plan. They wanted to go beneath the lake and sit under water and meditate on the holy names. So they would not be disturbed. So Lord Shiva wanted to empower them. He wanted to give them the ability to go under water, meditate, so they won't be disturbed. He found that these are worthy people with a worthy goal. They needed power. So he wanted to give them power. Power comes when you have a proper goal. I tell devotees this who approach me for help and I tell them very clearly that if you have a material situation that you're stuck in, fix your spiritual life. The power for fixing your material situation is going to come from fixing your spiritual life. If you're looking for a husband, you're looking for a wife, you're wanting to enter the ashram, then I said, ask Krishna for a partner who would help you chant, associate and read better. 
then there would be power behind you. If you simply look for a husband or wife, then you get in trouble. There's no power. You'll be dealing with your karma. You'll find a partner who will just be appropriate according to your karma. So very simply, when Lord Shiva said that there's wonderful goal, all help becomes available. He wanted to come and he wanted to provide power. And what is the power? There are two verses, and I just want to share this today, and in addition to a few things, which would help devotees in reaching their milestones. In the fourth canto, 28th chapter, there is verse 36 and 37. These are very important verses. Both these verses are being offered to Lord Aniruddha. Lord Aniruddha is the principle of the Supreme Mind. So the verses are 28, 36 and 37. Okay? Huh? 24. Th sorry. Fourth canto, 24th chapter, 36, 37. Fourth, fourth canto, 24th chapter, 36, 37. Okay? Now what I do is I chant these verses for almost half an hour just as much as someone repeats a mantra. I chant these verses, two verses for half an hour before I begin my japa. What these verses are promising to do and what is being promised by Lord Shiva is that this takes one through the process of anartha nivritti. So what is the obstacle which we spoke of earlier on in the class? We spoke of the 10 offenses. What is the 10th offense? To have material desires even after receiving so many instructions. So the idea is to be able to cleanse ourselves of non-priorities, to be able to cleanse ourselves of unwanted disturbances, and then we would be able to chant Namabas, at least at the Namabas level, offenseless chanting. These two verses are practically those which help the devotee to focus in being able to chant in a proper way. I have found this in my practice, and I've given this to many, many devotees over the years, and they have found extraordinary success in being able to deal with this verse. I mean, deal with the chanting, deal with the japa, with the life as such. It is, Namo Namo, please repeat after me. Namo Namo, namo, namo. Aniruddhaya, Aniruddhaya. Hishikesha, Hishikesha. Indriyatmane, Indriyatmane. Namaparamahamsaya, Namaparamahamsaya. Purnaya, Purnaya. Nibhartatmane, Nibhartatmane. Swarga, Swarga. Apavarga, Apavarga. Dwaraya, Dwaraya. Nityam, Suchi Sade Namaha Nama Hiranya Viriaya Chatur Hotaya Tantave. These two verses, when they're repeated, I just repeat it as Japa. I just repeat it continuously for 30 minutes before I begin my Japa. I have found that I have an extraordinary ability after that to be able to focus on the holy names. They practically allow the devotee to cleanse the heart. And the Lord, who is the super soul, who is being prayed to here, he becomes instructive and he clears everything and he sits in the purified heart and we're able to hear the holy names. Please take this up and try it out. The next time I come here, give me feedback as to how this worked out for you. It is an extra half hour, you might think, but the extra half hour would allow you to chant quality rounds. Would allow you to chant quality rounds. The extra half hour would allow you to chant quality rounds far beyond. It would also allow you to be completely free of anxieties. Lord Aniruddha, amongst the quadruple expansions, Vasudev, Sankarshan, Pradyumna, Aniruddha, he is the principle of the Supreme Mind. Here he is called Hishikesha Indriyatmani. He is also called Paramahamsa. He is compared to the sun. The sun, what is the quality of the sun? The sun comes in touch with dirt but offers its purification to even dirt, it does not get affected by the dirt. In a similar manner, we as devotees who function in the world, we come in touch with so many different material phenomena because we are in the grass ashram. We are dealing with the world so profoundly. And as a consequence, the challenge we face is that we constantly come in touch with phenomena which can affect us because we would start setting our goals up based on the office environment. Someone in the office has a certain goal, we would set ourselves up on that particular goal because they have an aspiration. It is association. It is association. So when we chant this mantra, I have found immense success in being able to chant quality rounds. I have also found it very easy to understand Shastra after reading these verses. And I've made this a part of my daily practice. Now, there are many devotees whom I've come in touch with who have taken this up. 
and they have shared the same success. So it's not something which is very particular to me. Okay, it is something which everybody has been experiencing. Okay, so this is the first thing which I just wanted to offer in terms of being able to understand how to proceed further. If you have a big goal, first ensure how to take care of the obstacle. This allows you to take care of the obstacle. Okay. Now, let's go back to see what is the precept given by our Acharyas. What is it which our Acharyas have given us for us to be able to move forward to remove obstacles on the path of being able to attain the goal? We have seen the goal. It's an awesome goal. We want to attain it. Everyone in this movement is very sincere. At their, whatever level they are, they are very sincere. There's no doubt about it. They are all aspiring at some day to be able to chant the pure name, Shuddha Nam. So we go from Nama Parad to Nama Bas, offenseless chanting. From offenseless chanting, we go to Shuddha Nam. What is Shuddha Nam? What is Shuddha Nam? Taste. I'm sorry? Taste of hearing Guru. Uh, taste? Yeah. No, the Ruchi comes. Ruchi is there. But what is it which gives Ruchi? What is it which gives attachment? What is Shuddha Nam? Shuddha Nam is the name which is called upon in Vraja. When Mother Ishoda is calling upon Krishna, does she have any confusion when she's calling upon Krishna? She calls upon Krishna and her calling of the name is imbued with love. When the cowherd boys are calling upon Krishna, it is imbued with love. When everyone in Raja are calling upon Krishna, that is Shuddha Nam. What is the distinction between our calling Krishna and their calling Krishna? What is the difference? There's a difference in the quality. Quality? What else? There's a fundamental difference. There's not enough love in that. Why? Because we are not feeling that love. It's true, but why? See, the reason why we can't feel the love when we're calling up Krishna's name, why do we struggle through the rounds? Why does a practicing devotee struggle with 16 rounds, which is minuscule? Yes, Prabhu. Still have material desire in the bottom of your heart. It's true, but there's a fundamental factor. The reason, the difference between Mother Eshoda's calling, the residents of Vajra calling, and our calling is the fact that I'm sorry. Is it because when we are chanting, we are not actually calling the Lord with love, but we are just chanting as we are doing a job? It's true, but I'm just saying that is that is the problem. But I'm, I'm talking about the why part. Mm. There's a fundamental reason. The fundamental reason is Mother Yashoda knows, knows that Krishna is her son. So the faith. We, no, it's not faith. It's a matter of experience. You don't need faith when you're sitting in front and then you know this is your son. So... Mother Ishoda knows this is my son. She knows. And so when she is calling, she's calling upon her son. When the cowherd boys are calling upon him, they know him. This is my friend. They know him. When the gopis are calling upon him, they know this is our beloved. So Suranam is a manifestation of the relationship. It is Sambandha Gyan. So if the Sambandha, the relationship that we have with Krishna, as it improves upon on a day-by-day -day basis, then we reach the point of recognizing who we are, and then we recognize who is the Lord, we understand the mellow of relationship, then the chanting takes off. Yeah. But for us to understand the relationship that we have, we don't even understand our relationship in this world with people whom we see. Yeah. What to say of Krishna, we have to depend on the holy names. Now the holy names are going to manifest the relationship. At the stage of Nama Bas, which is offenseless chanting, it is not going to be revealed. You are merely entering into the spiritual sky. We still are not aware of the mellows. If Mother Devaki was bewildered, how easy or how difficult should this be? But the holy name is benedictory. It offers this benediction. If one is sincerely chanting the holy names, they reach the point of being able to understand their specific relationship with Krishna. There's great detail revealed to the chanter of the holy name. To enthuse people, I just want to speak a little bit about this. The person who has attained bhava, he knows or she knows the street they live in, in Raja, in Goloka, they know. They know whether they live in Nandagaon or are they in Wunchagaon. They know which gaon they are around Raja. They know the specific street. They know the names of their parents. They know the names of their siblings. They know what they ought to do at what part of the day because they have this relationship with Krishna. Do we understand? Don't we all know what we ought to do when we begin the day with our relationships here in this world? Does it make sense? We all know we've got to pick up our son, daughter, drop them to school, pick them up. You know, this relationship is already has a foundation. We have direct perception. We have people sitting in front. This is my son. This is my daughter. This is what I have to do. 
we don't have that with krishna this is the point this is the missing link this missing link is being afforded to us by the holy names it is being afforded to us by the process of sadhana bhakti the sambandha gyan which is the whole purpose of celebrating janmashtami how does krishna care if we celebrate janmashtami here in manchester or in london wherever it is krishna's appearance what is the point the point is that this is practically increasing our sambandha our relationship so what is it which our acharyas did if we notice this picture i get very inspired when i see the picture of the six goswamis what do you notice in the picture this is the legacy that's been passed on to us we notice in the picture we have six men who are very frail physically in appearance they are wearing pieces of cloth they seem to have no other possession other than those pieces of cloth and the bead bags and they used to spend different nights under different trees they never used to sleep under the same tree even in raja they used to move from one tree to the other and why is it so inspiring it is their realizations which is practically allowing us some kind of access to spiritual the spiritual world what is it which they did which is allowing us to experience something wonderful did our acharyas do anything so different from what is being instructed to us the fact is no our acharyas had five primary activities this is the conclusion of shila bhakti vinod thakur in the chaitanya charitamrita there are 64 levels and 64 ways you can serve krishna but there are five primary activities what are the five primary activities bhakti vinod thakur said these are supreme these are supreme instruction sadhu sangha number 1 what did they do they used to associate with each other all the time they used to come and share realizations receive realizations in a very humble way this was being recorded there are so many exchanges between the different goswamis that are being recorded by our shastra they exchanged and shared realizations amongst the sangha sadhu sangha and together what else did they do they engaged i'm sorry but they did bhajana kriya exactly bhajana kriya the first thing that they did was they did namasmaran they did namasmaran they remembered the holy names they were chanting the gift of relationship with krishna is going to come because of the chanting of the holy names shri jiva goswami makes a statement in the sandarbhas he says you don't even have to you don't even have to read the holy names can grant everything it can grant complete realization you don't even have to read it can grant complete realization the holy names can grant complete realization shri gaur kishor das baba ji maharaj complete illiterate but fully realized in his practice that he was accepted by the greatest scholar of those times bhakti siddhanta saraswati thakur as a spiritual master what do we see in this how does this complete realization come if someone is completely illiterate they can't read it comes from the holy names all shastrik conclusions will become evident everything will become evident everything everything will become evident sometimes if you're very sincerely chanting and you have not even read one of prabhupada's chapters or cantos you will pick it up and you will find that i somehow knew this how did i know this you know i spoke of this where did this come from this realization came by the mercy of shila prabhupada because we chanted sincerely the holy names has the ability to reveal all shastrik conclusions all shastra conclusions so the third principle given to us by our acharyas is bhagavat shravana what did they say they say get together engage in namasmaran chant together and engage in hearing the bhagavatam the bhagavatam is going to train you to be able to move forward hear the bhagavatam why do we hear shastra why do we read shastra when you chant you're going to have experiences experiences are going to come when we engage in service after chanting chanting itself can give experiences spiritual experiences how do you qualify those experiences as being bona fide the qualification comes by reading shastra and saying yes there's a shastra conclusion so it is bona fide this realization is bona fide if you haven't found it in shastra record it some day you will if you already have some realization of the spiritual sky you haven't really found it in shastra yet record it write down people write down all the time the reflections some day you will find it in shastra bhagavat shravana is the third principle given to our acharyas the fourth principle given to us by our acharyas is to have the aspiration of wanting to live in the spiritual world mathura vas mathura vrindavan navadvip 
living in the spiritual world? What does it mean for us? Should you sell this building and go to Navadweep and Vrindavan? This is what the Shastra is saying. I'm a bit controversial. I'm going to ask questions which are a bit controversial because we want to clarify. Is this what Shastra is saying when they say Mathuravas? The Shastra is saying Mathuravas. We should aspire for it. So every devotee who is here is saying, no, there's nothing here. Let's just go to Vrindavan. Let's go to Mayapur. Let's settle down there. Is that what Shastra is instructing us? No. no. It is practically saying that if you do your Sadhu Sangha properly, if you do your Namasmaran properly, and if there is Bhagavad Shravana, you will manifest Vrindavan in Manchester. Yes. This is Shastra conclusion. You will manifest Vrindavan in Manchester. This is Shastri conclusion. Prabhupada installed dams. You go to the Bhaktivedanta Manor, you realize that there's something very special about that place. Yes. And then you realize there's something mystically special, very mystic. Mm -hmm. It's not ordinary. Then you realize that Srila Prabhupada, the arrangements that he made, were practically arrangements where dams were installed. You installed deities. He installed dams. He had the potency of practically making the spiritual world descend and stay on the planet. Go to Gitanagari, it's mystical. There is a special arrangement there. Prabhupada, when he was involved, Srila Prabhupada practically installed dams around the world. He gave access to the spiritual world. You enter into this place, you have a gate which goes right to the spiritual world. It's like an embassy. So this Mathuravas, which is being spoken of by our Acharyas, is simply an order given to us by our Acharyas saying, you do the rest and make it an embassy so the world can enter, so the rest of Manchester can enter the spiritual world through this embassy. This is the order given to us by our Acharyas. Make the arrangement such that the rest of Manchester can enter. It doesn't mean you wrap up and go. You make the arrangements. Isn't it awesome that the embassies are being opened up, you come in and then you get an entrance into the spiritual world. It's like a consulate or an embassy which gives you a visa. It's awesome. The last precept which was done was deity worship, Sri Murti Seva. I just want to spend a couple of minutes because on Sri Murti Seva, very importantly, Sri Murti Seva very specifically has a tenet. In the Gaudiya Vaishnava Siddhanta, we have five steps of initiation. It's Pancha Samskara. It is not one, it is five steps of initiation. It is not two. First aspect of initiation which is given is the question of being able to give Harinam. Harinam Diksha is given, which is the first step. And then you have Tapaha. Tapaha, Pundraha, Nama. Tapaha is Tapasya. So the disciple is ready to go through all forms of austerity in practically being able to receive the Guru's instructions into the heart. In other systems which are Vaishnava schools, which are bona fide, the Tapaha, which is the, the, the whole idea of being a property of Krishna, we become, I became Sri Vrindavan Das. My, my legal name is Sudarshan. I became Sri Vrindavan Das. You see? So now I became Sri Vrindavan Das in terms of being branded as a servant of Krishna, servant of the Dham, residence of Vrindavan. Now, this branding, Tapaha, is done literally in other Sampradayas. In the Sri Sampradaya, they heat up a conch and they heat up a chakra and they put impressions on either side, just as much as they would brand cattle. You are the property of Vishnu. You are the property of Krishna. You are branded. Mahaprabhu told us to write the holy names. He told us to write the names of Shri Sri Radha Krishna with clay markings. Our devotees do that. So that is a tapaha. This is, this is, this is the divine couple's property. I am the divine couple's property. I have nothing else. I am the divine couple. This is tapaha. Austerity. Purifying of the senses. When there is austerity, the senses get purified. Now, the second principle which is being spoken of is Pundra. The tilak that we wear, we wear it in 12 different spots in the body. Before initiation, you are just allowed to wear this tilak. But after initiation, this is actually a sacrament. The sacrament of wearing tilak in 12 different parts of a body is an important aspect of the sacrament of initiation. It is Pundra, Urdhava Pundra. It's very important. Very important. Twelve different parts of the body. Tilak is very important because it's a sacrament of initiation. It's one of the steps. Then you have Nama, which is Harinam, which we receive from the Guru. Right? And then you have Mantra. Mantra is the Gayatri Mantra which is being given. And the Gayatri Mantra is practically going to help us being able to move forward and understand our Sambandha. 
All of this is followed by yaja in Sanskrit, which is the worship of the deities. When the Guru, those days, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu demonstrated this. He took the Giriraj Shila, which he was worshipping, and gave it to Raghunath Das Goswami, saying, you worship. What did he do when he gave him the Giriraj Shila and gave him instructions? What did he do? When he passed on the Govardhan Dari to Raghunath Das Goswami, along with the Govardhan Shila, he passed on his Sambandha Gyan to Raghunath Das Goswami. When the Guru gives a deity to worship, those days they used to give Shilas, practically as a part of initiation, take a Shila to worship. When the Guru is giving a deity to the disciple, he is passing on his Sambandha to the disciple. So this whole idea of reaching the point of understanding who we are in relationship to Krishna is being covered in the Panchasamskaras, the initiation process. It is also being covered as a part of the deity worship that is required as the five primary steps which are being asked of by your acharyas. So devotees, I just want to speak one thing here. Did they do anything different from what they spoke? They were walking the talk. Was there anything else which was done other than the five things which he spoke of? There isn't any recorded history. There isn't. There really isn't. We keep hearing. Sometimes I get quite fed up when I hear Sometimes people say there's so much more. No, there isn't so much more. There isn't. There's only these five things which are very important. You do this properly, everything else is going to follow. Your material life will get fixed. I practice astrology as an astrologer. I was in the manor. I was giving a class, Srimad Bhagavatam class. A devotee sitting right in the front, just as you were. He asked me at the end of the class, Prabhu, I have a question. Is astrology required for devotees? And I said, no, it is not required. It is not required. If you do what the Acharyas have given us as a precept, it is not required. But it is merely a vision which gives you certain tools for planning your life and to align yourself. It is a planning tool which you can use and understand where the obstacles lie. If you're struggling, I can help you in certain ways. The point which I was trying to make is that it is not required. Nothing is required if you follow the precepts given by Acharyas. The five precepts given by Acharyas are so powerful. If you follow it very strictly, then nothing is required. It is not required. Everything else will get taken care of. Everything else is going to get taken care of. Now, what is it which you will set as milestones? Today we want to end the class by talking again about what we started out with. We have this awesome goal which is almost unattainable when you really think of the magnitude of what it is all about, when you think about how the different personalities in scripture struggled to even figure out their relationships. It's an awesome goal. We have all the help that we need from Srila Prabhupada and the Acharyas. There's no two ways about it. We are not alone. On our own, no qualifications. But with Srila Prabhupada, yeah, the zero gets a one next to it. You know, we have 100% access to the spiritual sky. So the first foremost awesome goal how do you set milestones to reaching it? How do you set milestones? Your question. So these five... Yeah, they simple. Are they are only objective? Yes. How would you become more... Uh, to work? How do you become more attached? The five, five precepts, the most important aspects which the devotees have to practice, which have been demonstrated by Racharyas, the five most important aspects. These five aspects have to become milestones. They have to become milestones. You will have to learn how to judge your relationships. Are we better? Do we hold grudges in the community with others? Ask yourself, if Chidmashtami is the day where we have grudges in the heart with other devotees, it is the day for us to be able to go back and look to see how much we have contributed into the conflict. Take a position and say that I have contributed into this conflict as much as the other person. Perhaps it's my fault. The moment you start looking at everything as your fault, you would actually see the reasoning to get out of it. So do we hold grudges which are preventing us from engaging in nice sadhu sangha? Do we have a desire of wanting other things and having this particular desire of engaging in the world where we still have some taste? Some people still have a taste of the outside world. Some of us can handle it, most cannot. Most cannot. That's the reason why Mahaprabhu has instructed 
asatsanga tyaga so sadhu sangha set a barometer to see if we have grudges see if the society here the community of devotees has been able to move forward and resolve their grudges resolve their conflicts fewer conflicts means the community is functioning in a much better way there can be temples with super efficient management teams but if the management team is obnoxious they will have super big problems to deal with they will have super big problems to deal with they will be very efficient but they will have super big problem there would be temples where the managers themselves may not be fully qualified they could be brahmanical they may not be kshatriya types they may not have enough knowledge to handle money they could be very brahmanical and they are just simple because they are so simple you will find that everything is running smoothly and there are no major conflicts there are no major issues purely because they depend so much on krishna the point we want to make here is set a barometer to see if there are too many conflicts set a barometer to see if there are grudges and these are things that have to be openly resolved because it's a huge obstacle if you have grudges against vaishnavas huge obstacle if you can't resolve it it's big trouble it's big trouble it has to be resolved so that's your first barometer for the year of 2017 before next janmashtami if there are conflicts resolve the conflicts resolve the conflicts very important next barometer namasmaran namasmaran namakirtan devotees are very enthused when there's good music and when there's good singing they participate in kirtan many devotees are very eager for kirtan but they are not so eager to sit and chant they are not very enthused mm-hmm. because there's no ruchi they are more into the music than into the naam you see they are more into the music than into the naam so for those devotees who are more into the music than to the naam then they would have to contribute to spending more time in being able to engage in naam smaran mm-hmm. how can i sit and chant how can i sit and chant what i have found works for me is that if i choose the same spot every day and if i get up at the same time if i do the same activities my mind becomes very controllable if you keep changing your spots changing your times then you have you are an open target the mind will take over you will be a victim no you know very soon so examine namasmaran it is not kirtan it is namasmaran where you have to focus on kirtan is wonderful but namasmaran is important okay namasmaran is very important Namasmaran is very very important. Japa is the most important thing. If you want to give up everything else and you want to just do one aspect, one limb of devotional service, engage in chanting. Engage in chanting. You see? Engage in chanting. Shri Prabhupada used to engage devotees based on their propensities. This is based on conditioning. You, he used to have a devotee who just wants to read, which is fine. He's very brahmanical. He doesn't want to engage in service. He says he is doing his service. Let him do it. he is developing devotional credits he is also reading shastra which is equivalent and he is getting fully absorbed but the point is that those devotional credits that you accumulate by doing other things that you like doing have to be spent in being able to improve your namasmaran you see you are developing currency you see before you go out and buy a new car you need currency in a similar way when you do things on your own but you believe that there is something which i have propensity for i want to just do it do it you're going to get credits but those credits are currency that currency will eventually be spent in chanting namasmaran so examine if you don't have taste for chanting then make it a goal to make changes beg for mercy beg for mercy please include the step which i i spoke of earlier of chanting the prayers to lord aniruddha it helps immensely if there is no taste it helps immensely in being able to fix the mind then the third aspect is bhagavad shravan easy to monitor if you're not a reader please listen if you're not a reader please listen find the, the there are empty number of speakers and it's also accessible find one speaker who motivates you and listen half hour each day while you write to work you know when you're on your treadmill whatever you do listen please contribute to bhagavad shravan it's very important because when you listen to someone who is superior their realizations their faith their conviction comes into our heart gurumukha padmavakya chitete kori aikya 
it comes in and it establishes itself and destroys the nations. Listen to someone whom you inspire to listen to. It's very important. Krishna is attracting you. He attracts through the holy names. He attracts through the words of Guru. He's attracting you. Submit to that attraction. That's a benchmark. You see, quantifiable benchmark. It is not something which is vague. What is the fourth one? Mutravas. It all depends on the other three. And if you don't do the other three properly, then deity worship becomes very difficult and challenging. Deity worship is completely dependent on chanting and Bhagavad Shravan. Okay? So we have summarized. We started out by wanting to establish milestones and goals for the year. This is Janmashtami. We then spoke about the obstacles. We spoke about the rarity of what we have been given. We spoke about the stages in chanting. And then we spoke about what is missing, which is Sambandha. We talked about how do you attain Sambandha. We talked about the five different precepts given by Acharyas. We have found that it has worked for them. It will work for us. And it is being demonstrated by Shastri conclusion. And then you also have the rest, which is the part about um, being able to implement it and to be able to measure ourselves. First, write down where the problem is. Talk to someone who is your mentor or your Siksha Guru or whoever it is who is mentoring you. Write down where the problem is and then submit to them periodically. If you don't calibrate yourself, if you don't measure yourself and if you think you're going to attain this awesome goal, you're going to go nowhere. I'm sorry for being so blunt. Really yeah? Honesty is very difficult. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so sorry if I'm too blunt, but yeah. Has to be honest. Yeah, because it's a fact. Yeah. We have nothing to lose, you know, as sadhus, what do we have to lose anyway? We speak and we speak and we just speak to inspire others. And if Prabhupada is pleased and if someone takes up the chanting based on this, we then. I'm sorry? We have everything to gain. Everything to gain, yeah. And I have everything to gain too. Srila Prabhupada makes a statement there, in the, uh, just to end with this, very inspiring statement, end with this, because you're all late. So in Dhruva Maharaj's uh, chapter, he practically makes a statement that Dhruva Maharaj was so powerful that even though his stepmother wanted him to die, she still gave him such a powerful instruction. You see, she wanted him to die. She said, you go die and come and come back into my womb. Then I'll make you sit on the father's lap. But she said, go worship Narayan. Then he can give you the position. So the instruction of worshipping Narayan was given by a very envious person. But the instruction itself was so worthy that you could take it up. And then because the stepmother, even though she was so envious, instructed. And Dhruva Maharaj succeeded. Srila Prabhupada writes, that even if one of my disciples, one of my disciples succeeds in implementing what I have said, then by his mercy, I would be able to go back to Godhead. Hmm? Because mother, the stepmother went back to Godhead because Dhruva Maharaj succeeded. She became the instructing guru, Siksha Guru. She was delivered. <laughs> she gave powerful instruction in a very nasty way. But it was powerful anyways, wasn't it? Namas Maran. So I'll end here, you know, and conserve mine and your energy as well. And, you know, I was just wanting to share a few things. And thank you so much for inviting me and to give you, give me your association. Give me an opportunity to serve Shri Prabhupada. Thank you so much. Shri Prabhupada ki. Mataji, yes. Sorry again. Number, 424, 36, 37. Fourth canto, 24, 36, 37. Yeah. Any, any other question or comment? Oh, <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> so actually, in the daily worship, so it's become more glorious. So the dam can manifest those three things. Yeah. Exactly. All five. Yeah. What I was thinking is the last two, as you said, the dependent of the three. The other three. And mm -hmm. Madhuma, you know, he, he once said that he couldn't understand that these brahmacharis who were who were serving the deities daily felt like they should come to the rest of us. 
Okay, so it doesn't mean that just because we're on, we're doing daily service, but actually we've revived devotional service. That has to be more than that. The, the, actually, <coughs> daily worship is perhaps, I would say, extraordinarily powerful. But for one to appreciate deity worship, one has to chant. Yeah. One can't really appreciate deity worship if you don't chant. Yeah. I, I heard at some point, I'm not sure if it's true, you know, you all should know better, that His Holiness Radhat Maharaj, yeah. he had requested the Pujaris in Chopati that they should be chanting 32 rounds before they approach the deity. Yeah, I, I don't know if that is indeed, was it implemented, was it true? I have no idea. Maybe I, you know, I, I don't know. But the point which I'm trying to make here is that it's not so much as to whether it was implemented, but there's great truth to that statement. That one can't really relate to the deity if you can't chant. You see? And Sri Ajiva Goswami was very clear. He said, you chant when you're chanting. There was so much emphasis. So the idea is to develop Sambandha. Krishna Sambandha is not going to be there without chanting. Some devotees are very good at deity worship. They're very good. But you'll also find that they would have a lot of attachment to the material world. Immense. You will find that Pujaris, for many, many years, they could serve the deities with great dedication. And then all of a sudden, you will find that they are leading a completely mundane life. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is because it's so powerful that you can also commit offenses. Mm -hmm. To prevent the offenses, we have to first chant Harina. Mm -hmm. yeah? So we understand the Sambandha, that we are approaching the deity. Yeah. Yeah? That's where the problem arises. That's the reason why you know, the desires develop. And, and because you're so close to uh, you know, the 5,000 watt line. You know, you can get electrocuted, you know, you can get electrocuted or you know how to plug it in for while lighting up the whole city. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a fact. Yeah, our Acharyas are there, but ultimately, ultimately, our humble realization is if you know how to hold on to the beat back for life, that's all we need. This is demonstrated. If you know how to hold on to the bead bag with attachment and you're able to call upon the holy names, that is all we need. That is all we need, ultimately speaking. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. <clears throat> Please forgive me if my tone and my tenor was in any way, you know, abrasive, offensive, hurt your feelings or in any manner. Yeah, it's, it's, just, yeah, it's just my nature. I sometimes get a little enlivened. I, I sometimes do not know why I say what I say. <clears throat> yeah. So, yeah, don't, don't get me wrong. It was not mean, meant to be abrasive. It was not meant to be authoritarian. I have no authority over anyone, not even myself. So, yeah. No, there was an urgency, and that urgency is what came across. Oh, thank you, Mataji. Yeah, I, I, I feel some intense urgency. Yeah. I do. And when I meet devotees who are very sincere and who are struggling, yeah. and they have everything, and all they need to do is just correct themselves in some small way, and they would be blazing forward. And when I see that, I, I feel a bit enthused. And I beg my spiritual master and Srila Prabhupada to make me speak as well as to what is needed in any congregation when I go to. Yeah. So I tend to kind of align myself with the mood that my Guru Maharaj is practically assisting the devotees in certain ways. So, um, yeah, so, some people appreciate it and some people might think it's a little too um, aggressive. Uh, but it's all right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think... I think well, in the end, you're very serious, yeah. and your classes are full serious, so I think that's a fair exchange. <laughs> Thank you for your encouragement, Prabhu. You always are very encouraging, um, you know. You encourage people, yes. Yeah, very, very, <laughs> very encouraging. Thank you for your encouragement, and I hope uh, I can serve the devotees for many years to come. Yeah. yeah. It's just that the Vaishnava Sangha, we have to be careful in all exchanges. Yeah. yeah. When we sit on the Vyasasana, we have authority. And that authority comes if our sincere desires are there to be able to share. That's the purpose of sitting on the Vyasasana. But um, internally, one realizes that they are not qualified whatsoever to talk to Vaishnavas or to be able to speak and Shastra even. You know, where's the question of, you know, having realizations? Because you would have noticed many of you when you try to speak, sometimes you have complete block. You can't think, you can't even, you know, read. Why does it happen? It's almost as if, Krishna is saying, I'm not going to give you any help, you see? And sometimes he gives all the help, saying, okay, you, you're stepping aside, so let me come through. So I tell many people that they ask me, what is your objective? And I say, all I'm trying to do is I'm trying to step aside. If I can step aside, my spiritual master would come and he would do what is necessary.
Sri Maharaj actually says that to the people who won't book the sushi. Get out of the way. Get out of the way. <laughs> it's a fact. Yeah. It's a fact, Prabhu. That's true for everything we do. Practically, you know, this movement, imagine if this movement was run by our, our capability. <laughs> Where would this movement be? My goodness. If it were to depend on our intelligence and our struggles, <coughs> our capacity, you know, whatsoever, this movement would be in doldrums. It would be in big trouble. Yeah, it's being managed by Krishna, so it's running. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, Srila Prabhupada Ki. Sri Krishna Janmashtami Mahotsav Ki. Jai. Thank you so much. Jai Shri Nava Prabhu Ki. Jai. Jai.